tell you what, two, two things, okay? This is the Word of God. God gave this to His people, okay? Not to seminarians, okay, but to His people. And He gave the Spirit of God to every born-again person. And every one of us has the privilege and the duty to study this book and to find out what it means. Okay? Paul said, there, or actually Luke writing the, the book of Acts said that the Bereans were more noble than other people because they searched the scriptures daily. They were checking out the Apostle Paul. Paul was preaching and they're trying to see, is it true? And they were noble because they realized that you discover whether a preacher is true by comparing it to this. Okay? And if what he says compares favorably to this, if you can find it in the Bible, well then his preaching is correct. Okay? Praise God for him. Okay? Um, it doesn't matter what college you went to. Some of the best preachers that have ever lived never went to college. Okay, that is the absolute truth. Never went to college. Some of them never finished high school. And they were wonderful preachers of God's Word. And you can check their sermons out, some of them even today, and find out that, hey, they are straight down the line with the Bible. And all they did was study it on their own. Okay, the Spirit of God is our teacher. And nobody can come and say, you know, well, you know, I went to seminary. Okay, I've got this degree and that degree, and I went to this prestigious institution. It doesn't matter. Okay, one of the, the things that we have seen in some of the replies is uh, talking about history. You know, well, don't you know that historically Baptists have always been Calvinists? Well, that's, that's not true. Okay, it, that's a lie. Now, historically, English Baptists primarily have been Calvinists. I know a guy in Belarus who will tell you that Eastern European Baptists are mostly Arminian. Believe you can lose your salvation. American Baptists take that in-between position that salvation is by grace through faith and you cannot lose it. Okay, which is the biblical position. Um, but what does history matter? Okay, it doesn't matter a bit. What somebody believed 400 years ago, 500 years ago, if everybody four or 500 years ago believed something different than what we believe, it doesn't matter at all. The thing is, whose belief is true to the Word of God? And if it's us, and there's only a handful of us, we're right. Okay? If it was them back then, then, you know, if they can prove it to us from the Bible, then we better change. Okay? But I keep waiting for somebody to show me tulip in the Bible. Okay? I really do. Uh, show me that man cannot believe. I mean, give me a Bible verse. I mean, you realize, okay, and I haven't even got to my message yet. Uh, and maybe I won't. No, no, we will. Um, total depravity, meaning the Calvinist version, man is incapable of believing until God sovereignly regenerates him and then gives him the gift of faith. Unconditional election. God sovereignly in eternity past went down the list of everybody who's ever going to live, which is probably about 10 billion people to this point. There's 7 billion alive today. Um, and he went any, meeny, miny, mo, what, however, whatever method he picked. He had no conditions Okay, he just picked according to his own will. 
And those that he picked get to go to heaven. Those that he didn't pick go to hell. And they have absolutely no chance. They cannot change that at all. Okay? Um, limited atonement. Christ only died for a few. Just those that he elected, which is probably around, I don't know, if it's 5% of, of the, all the humans that ever lived, I'd be surprised. Okay? It may be 5%. Maybe it's 10%. I doubt it. Um, but he only died for those. Irresistible grace. God's grace cannot be resisted. If God picked you, you're it. You have no choice. Okay? There is no free will. You think you make decisions, but that's not true. That is a fiction that God allows you to think. Okay? You really don't have a choice. Perseverance of the saints, if you're elected, then you have to live to the rest of, to, uh, live until your death in faith in Christ and the good works that will follow faith. Not should follow faith, not might follow faith, but will follow faith. And if you don't live a good life, if you blow it at the end, then you were never saved to start with. Um, those things are incredible. Jesus didn't die for everybody. Wait a minute. Why can't I find a verse in the Bible? If, 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 if that's true, this is so huge that you would think God would say it somewhere plain and clear. Wouldn't you? Okay. God picks and chooses who's going to go to heaven. Why are there verses that, yeah, you can make them say that if you're into making the Bible say things, but they don't say it plain and clear. Okay? Predestination and, and that kind of thing. Why are there no verses that actually just say it? I mean, these things are enormous. Christ said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, why? Why should we do that? Okay? America has sent untold numbers of missionaries around the world who have died early deaths and are buried, if they got buried at all, in some unbelievable place because they thought it would make a difference. Somebody out there could get saved and go to heaven because they went and sacrificed. But why? You see, if, if Calvinism is true, this is all a game. Okay, God's playing a game with us that's not real. Because what you do was determined by God before the founding. If, okay, you've got a neighbor who's lost. And you witness to him. Or you don't. Does it make a difference? It doesn't matter. And what you do, according to the Calvinist, I mean, God says give him the gospel, but you don't give him the gospel. Well, God determined that you were not going to do that. You get it? I mean, that's awful. Everything you do, every choice you make, and every action you commit. In fact, Philip Melanchthon, who was an associate, a contemporary of John Calvin in Switzerland, says that, that every thought you think was determined by God before the foundation of the world. Okay, how about that? Every thought you think, my goodness. And yet we're supposed to believe God's a holy God? If He created my thoughts, He's not real holy. Okay, my goodness. That's a horrible belief. Okay? A horrible belief. Okay, we got to get started here on my message. Unconditional election and 
predestination. The canons of Dort, which is the, the Dutch Reformed Church, spelling out exactly what they believe. Okay, it's their statement of faith, uh, and it's got to do with this Calvinist versus Arminian uh, argument that they had. Um, says this, unconditional election, the unchangeable purpose of God, <clears throat> whereby before the foundation of the world, he hath out of mere grace, according to the sovereign good pleasure of his will, chosen from the whole human race a certain number of persons to redemption in Christ. Okay? Unconditional election, God has chosen who's going to heaven and who isn't. Okay? That's basically what it means. Um, I went, and, and when I heard this, I couldn't believe it. This was the first Baptist preacher that I ever heard who was a Calvinist. Okay? The very first. He was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hallandale, Florida. Okay, which is down uh, like outside of Fort Lauderdale. Um, and he said this, and I heard this with my own ears. This was while I was in Bible college. It was like 69 to 71, sometime in that time frame. I don't know the man's name. If I did, I probably wouldn't tell you because what he says is terrible. He says, and I heard this, okay, and I remembered it so clearly, and I repeated it over and over, so I know this is close to word perfect, okay? You should thank God that He chose you and passed over your neighbor instead of choosing your neighbor and passing over you. Okay, now I can say, thank you, Lord, that I'm saved, that I'm going to heaven. But I'm supposed to be grateful that my neighbor was not picked and he's going to hell? God picked me instead of him? You know, I don't know, does that make me some kind of special person or something? I mean, that's horrible. Okay, if my neighbor's going to hell, I'm not happy about it. I'm sad about it. And if I can do anything to prevent that, I should. All right? Um, okay, let's look at some verses that have to do with this subject. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And these are verses that they use to teach this doctrine. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Okay, now this is a passage that the Calvinists used to say, See, you were picked. You didn't just believe, you were picked. That's why you believed. Um, according as He has chosen us in Him. Okay, we're chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? That we should be holy and without blame before us in love, Having predestinated us. Okay, now this, the way this is phrased this is important. He's connecting election and predestination. Okay, which the Calvinist has no problem. They connect them too. Okay, they're obviously connected. He chose us having predestinated us. Okay, He chose us in Christ. He didn't choose us individually, but He chose those in Christ before the foundation of the world, for what? That we should be holy and without blame before Him. Okay, God has chosen that those who are in Christ will someday stand before Him holy and without blame. Having predestinated us, He has predetermined, predetermined that we will 
go through the adoption of children. Now we're going to show you where that is in the Bible in just a moment. The adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. So we're chosen for an end or a purpose. He didn't choose us to believe. He chose us to be holy and without blame before Him. He has predestinated us unto the adoption. He has predetermined and guaranteed what's going to happen in the future. Um, is adoption, a lot of folks don't understand what adoption is. Is adoption becoming a child of God? Okay, in our society, when you adopt a child, you take a child who is not a member of your family, and you legally make him a member of your family. That's what we mean in America and most parts of the world by adoption. The Jewish people, the Roman people, and the Greek people had a different idea of adoption. Okay, adoption was when your child reached a certain age or a certain level of maturity that you decided he is now grown up. He's now mature. And you said to the world, this, my son, is now my adult son. Okay? That's what adoption was. The Jewish people still do it today. And they call it bar mitzvah. And they have recently, in the last few years, begun to do bat mitzvah for their daughters. For centuries and centuries it was just for the boys. But now they do it for both. At that age, the boys, at least, and maybe the girls too, I'm not sure, they get to participate in their temple, their synagogue practices. They get to stand in the front, open the scroll, and read the Word of God to the congregation. Okay, that's part of being mature. Um, this is what he's talking about here. Roman, Greek, or Jewish type adoption. And so it's saying that this child of God has grown to a point that they are mature, or they, they've reached a, a, a point that they are mature Christians. Okay, now we're going to show um, where that is in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, well, Philippians 3, 9, uh, be found in Him, He's chosen us in Him, be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Um, that's how we get saved. We are saved not by our righteousness, but by Christ's righteousness which is credited or imputed to us. You know, the illustration that you've seen your pastor do over and over that I used this morning. Um, here we are with sinners. At Calvary, our sin was credited to Christ. Okay, He took our sin as though it was His sin, which it wasn't. But it was credited, imputed to Him. And He died and paid for it. He was raised from the dead and then His righteousness is credited to us and we are now found in Christ. Okay, not with our righteousness, which is nothing, but with Christ's righteousness, which is perfect. And that's how we get to go to heaven. Not on, on us, not on anything we've done, but all on what Christ has done and, and His righteousness. Okay, so what is adoption? Look in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of, of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay, when you trusted Christ as Savior, you received the Holy Spirit. And He's a, a number of things to us. He's our comforter, He's our teacher, and on and on. Um, he's our seal, He's the earnest of our inheritance, and so on. Um, but He is also the Spirit of adoption. He is the one who is bringing us to maturity. He is the one who is working in us to make us better and better and better all the time. 
And of course, we have to respond to that. It's not automatic. You don't, you don't become a mature Christian just, you know, bingo. You know, no, you have to respond. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. You have to say yes. Okay, if you say no, then you're grieving and quenching the Spirit of God, and you're not growing. Okay, you may be backsliding. That's a good old Baptist term, isn't it? Backsliding. This Baptists know lots about backsliding. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I heard oh, many, many years ago on some Christian TV show, they were, were interviewing, I think it was the Blackwood Brothers. I mean, this shows how far back this goes. And uh, they were talking to J.D. Sumner, who was a bass with this phenomenal voice. And uh, he says, well, we Baptists, we don't believe in backsliding, but we're pretty good at it. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, okay, we've received the spirit of adoption. Well, then he says in Romans 8, 23, just a few verses later, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. See, we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, we have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption okay now see we have the spirit of adoption but the adoption hasn't happened yet we're waiting we're longing we're groaning for the adoption and then it says to wit the redemption of our body okay the adoption is the rapture of the church. Okay? That's the adoption. That's when, and so we're waiting for it. We're hungry for it. We're yearning and longing for it. I'll tell you, beloved, don't you sometimes get sick of yourself? Okay? Wouldn't you like to be perfect right now? Wouldn't you like to never have a bad thought? Never get angry? Never get frustrated? Never get jealous? Never get envious. Wouldn't it be nice if you never had those thoughts anymore? Instead, you love everybody. You're always kind. You're always gentle. You're always humble. Okay? You know something? <clears throat> Heaven is going to be so great, it's unbelievable. Okay? Do you enjoy the fellowship of the saints down here? I do. We have so much fun in our little church down in Florida. I mean, most Sundays we've got 16 to 20 people. Okay? But we have a ball. We love each other. We enjoy each other's company. Christians can have more fun just standing around talking after church than the world can have with, you know, all the booze and the drugs that they can find. Okay? We have a blast without any of that junk. Well, guess what? Someday, we're all going to be in heaven. Not a single solitary one of us will have a sin nature anymore. Imagine what the fellowship of the saints is going to be like then. Okay? It's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. And we're going to have that forever. Okay? Man, it's fantastic. Well, here he says, we're waiting for that. We're waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. When the Lord descends and he calls us to come up here and we go up to be with him. 1 John 3, 2, where it says that we will be made like him for we shall see him as he is. Okay? You and I, just like that, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed. And we are going to be like Jesus Christ. We're going to see Him as He really is. And that experience of seeing the Lord face to face like that is going to transform us. We're being transformed now by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption. But at that moment, the transformation process is going to be totally completed and we will be like Christ. Okay? Boy, I can hardly wait. Isn't that going to be good? 
Boy, that's going to be wonderful. Okay, well, look in Romans 8, 29. Okay, we're talking about unconditional election, which Ephesians 1 ties in with predestination and ties into the adoption. For whom he did foreknow. They say no conditions to election, but it talks about foreknowledge. There is a condition. God foreknows. Okay, he elects people that he foreknows. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What are we predestinated to? We're predestinated to the rapture of the church and being made entirely like Christ. God has predestined that all believers will be just like Jesus in heaven someday. Okay, that's what predestination is. That's what election is all about. Okay, it's not God looking down through eternity past and saying, okay, I see Howard, and Howard, I pick Howard. Okay, and I'll pick Mrs. Howard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, it is so simple. And there is not any verse in the Bible that ever says God picks and chooses who will believe and who will not. Not a single verse. He chose us in Christ to be raptured and become like Him. We will stand before Him someday holy and without blemish. That's going to be a great day. Okay. Um, I put in there as well 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Another verse that uh, the Calvinist uses, but which doesn't say uh, what they think it says. Elect, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Okay, there is a condition, and it's what God foreknows. Um, I think I may have mentioned this morning, but let me say it again. Um, what is it that God foreknows? Well, God foreknows everything. Okay, there's not, nothing that will ever happen throughout all eternity that God doesn't know in advance is going to happen. That is an attribute of God that is part of His deity. Some Calvinists would say, well, God can only foreknow those things that He predetermines. Huh. That's, that's a wild one. Uh, he can only foreknow what He predetermines. No, it's God's nature to know in advance everything that's going to happen. And He doesn't have to predetermine it for it to happen. Okay? Um, what is it that God foreknows? Well, go through the Bible and ask yourself the question, what is it that makes a difference, according to the Word of God, what is it that makes the difference between who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? There's one thing over and over and over and over, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. That's all there is. That is the only thing that makes the difference between sinners in hell and saved people in heaven. That's the one and only thing. And the Bible tells us that over and over and over. So God foreknows, I think it's clear, God foreknows who's going to believe. And He predestines believers to the rapture. Okay? I'm looking forward to it. I have no fears or doubts that I'm going to be one of those taken up. Okay? Now, I don't know if I'm going to come out of the grave or be one of those who is alive and remain and gets caught up. Okay? But I'm going up one way or the other. Okay? And the dead in Christ rise first. So maybe that's even better. I don't know. No, I'm... Uh, Dr. Cameron used to say, I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. Uh, and it would be nice if that would happen for every single one of us. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, another verse that Calvinists like to use. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, 
Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God has chosen to save you through the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, bringing you to faith in Christ. That's the method He uses. Okay? And a, a future sermon, part of this, this series, we're going to look at some verses that make it very, very clear. How does a person get saved? Well, you hear the Word. Okay, you have to hear the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. If you never hear the Bible, you never get saved. You hear the Word, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and you put your faith in Christ, and you're born again. And you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and He indwells you, and there's a whole lot of other things that happen subsequent to that. But you get saved because the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and leads you to put your faith in Christ, and you believe it, and you're saved. Okay? That's what happens. Uh, and like I say, we'll look into that. Uh, there's several verses that I want to show you on that in a future message. Um, God does not elect or predestine lost people to someday believe. Believers are elected and predestined to stand before the Father in the image of His Son. And we can say hallelujah for that. Praise God, that's what He's going to do. Predestination and election are both according to foreknowledge, which is an attribute of God. Uh, election and predestination are not attributes, they're actions that God takes based on something that He foreknows. And I believe that has to do with our faith in Christ. Uh, so there is a condition to election. Okay, there is a condition, and it's God's foreknowledge of our faith, our belief. Um, do Calvinists really believe in unconditional election? Well, I would have to say the answer to that is yes and no. Okay? Um, yes, maybe. Uh, a fellow named C. Samuel Storms, uh, who's a Calvinist, says this, By making election conditional upon something that man does, even if what he does is simply to repent and believe the gospel, God's grace is seriously compromised. Okay, this is something the Calvinists do. If God doesn't do absolutely everything that there is to do on this subject of salvation, then it is not by grace. So God has to pick you, predestinate you, regenerate you, give you faith so that it's all God. If you have to do anything, even believe, then you take away the grace of God. It's just a portion of a verse, Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Okay, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Faith does not compromise the grace of God. Faith indeed confirms the grace of God. It's by faith that it might be by grace. If it was works, it would not be grace. But because it's faith, it is grace. We are saved by God's grace, and it's because of faith. Um, So do Calvinists really believe? Um, I would say no, they don't. Some of them do, uh, but not all of them. Um, okay, let's look at Romans 4, 1 and 5, or 1 through 5. Okay, the same passage that I just quoted you, part of verse 16. Um, but this is a real good passage, very important. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. 
Okay, if Abraham was saved by his works, if he was justified, declared righteous by God, by his works, then he'd be able to boast about it. Okay? Because God would be in his debt. Um, what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He didn't work, instead he believed. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you work your way to heaven, which is what most religions teach, including most Christian religions, if you try to work your way to heaven, then it's not a gift, it's a reward. Okay, most of you spent your whole life working and getting a paycheck. Did your boss ever come up to you and say, you know, hey, good job, here's a gift. Uh-huh. No, wait a minute. That's my paycheck. I earned that. Okay, that's no gift. You know, I just put in 40 or 50 or 60 or however many hours earning that paycheck. Um, well, if you work your way to heaven, it's not a gift, it's a reward. Um, because He owes you. You gave Him your time and your effort, and now He owes you a paycheck. It's a debt. Okay? But, verse 5, this is important. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. You see, faith is not a work. There's no merit to faith. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. When you trust Christ as your Savior, in effect you're saying to God, I am helpless, I am hopeless, there is absolutely nothing I can do, there is no way I can gain my salvation but by your Son. And I will allow Him to save my soul and take me to heaven it all depends on Him. There's nothing of yourself involved. You can't do a thing to save yourself. And your faith is entirely in Him. You're trusting Him. There is no merit in that faith or that trust. The merit is all on the part of Christ. Okay? He is the worthy one, not you and me. I have never heard anybody bragging. One thing I read the other day that a Calvinist was saying, well, you know, if people think it's their own faith, then they're going to have grounds for boasting. I have yet to hear anybody bragging about themselves. I was so smart, I put my faith in Christ. <laughs> have you ever heard a Christian say that? I never have. Trusting Christ is a rather humbling thing. I can't do it. That's why most people won't come to Christ. Their pride won't let them. I can do it myself. Remember the old, was it Bayer Aspen commercial? Please, mother, I'd rather do it myself. Well, that's the way people are when it comes to salvation. Okay, I'd rather do it myself, God. And God says, but I'm perfectly willing and able to do it for you if you'll let me and they won't do it. So, I mean, faith is not a work. Faith has no merit. And faith doesn't cause pride. Faith causes gratitude. Faith causes praise to God. But it doesn't cause pride in our hearts. Praise God. He is so very, very, very good to us. Okay, now I asked the question, do Calvinists really believe that election and predestination have no condition? Well, I would say not really. Okay, and the reason I say not really, Calvin taught, and all the Calvinists I know of, they believe this. Calvin taught that being born into a Calvinist family automatically made the child one of the elect. 
Okay? I mean, don't Calvinists believe that? Well, sure, their kids are elected. Right? And infant baptism certainly helps. And Calvin said that infant baptism made a child one of the elect as long as you believed in its efficacy. Well, who believes in its efficacy? Not the infant that's getting sprinkled. Okay? His parents. So this kid becomes one of the elect by his parents' faith in baptism. Not in Christ, but in baptism. Okay, not every Calvinist believes baptism is necessary for salvation. Not, every, not everyone, not every church. But an awful lot of them do. Many, many, many of them do believe that baptism is essential. And if you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven. And some of them even call it prevenient grace. It's grace given before the fact. Okay, before the event. No, they haven't come to Christ yet, but we know that they will. Okay, so we baptize them ahead of time, and the baptism is, this is what Luther said, baptism is the means of God giving the child grace. It's the means of grace. That's how you get the grace. And yet I thought, for by grace are you saved through faith? Not through baptism, but through faith. Okay? Well, so they believe if you're born into a Calvinist family or a Lutheran family, because they believe the same thing on this, if you're born into that kind of a family, then you're one of the elect. So there seems to be a condition. Okay? In fact, birth and baptism seem to be conditions to becoming one of the elect. Which, isn't this kind of crazy since this is supposedly all determined in eternity past? So how can it depend on the family you're born into? Or whether you're... Do you get the, the, the lack of logic here? It doesn't make... It's not only not biblical, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so for many Calvinists, there are two conditions, birth and baptism. Now this leads me to think some things, to ask some questions. Um, if there are no conditions to election, then why are so many of the elect born into Calvinist families? Okay? If there are no conditions, I mean, then you would expect the elect to be spread around the world kind of randomly. Okay? Why are so many of the elect white people of Western European descent? Okay? Dutch descent. Scottish descent, um, German descent. Why is that? Because God loves the, the Scottish Presbyterians and the, the Dutch Reformed and the German Lutherans more than other people? But there's no conditions. Isn't it odd that so many of the elect live in the same part of the world and are the same color? Isn't that peculiar? when there's supposedly no conditions? Why is it that so many of the elect were alive from around 1500 to the present time? Okay, human history has reached about 6,000 years now. Why is there a 500 year period in which most of the elect lived if there are no conditions? Why weren't saved people spread out through the ages more? And why aren't there more elect in Japan or China than there are? And why is it that when a missionary goes somewhere and preaches the gospel, he finds elect people? But before he went, there were no elect there. Isn't that odd? You see, this is all silly. This is foolish. It doesn't make a lick of sense, and you can't find any verses in the Bible that teach it. So, I, you know, I think it's time to, to end.
to get rid of it. Um, anyhow, um, don't be afraid of big words, even if they're in the Bible. Election is a good word. It means choosing. Okay? If it, uh, an elect person is a chosen person. And you might be elected for a lot of things. There are other verses in the Bible that use the word that have other meanings. Israel was elect. What were they elect for? They were God's chosen, His elected people to bring the Word of God and the Messiah to the world. They were chosen for that purpose. And because of that, they have been hated by everybody else on earth. Okay? That's amazing. So election can be for a lot of things. And it is used in different ways in the Bible. Don't be scared of it. it you know, when somebody says, oh, but you're predestinated. Say, glory, hallelujah, I am. The rapture could come any day now. Okay? I'm going to be in heaven, and I'm going to be like Christ. And... You know, the new Mike Floyd isn't going to be anything like the old Mike Floyd. He's going to be like Jesus. And praise God for that. Um, don't be afraid of the verses that the Calvinists use. Ask yourself, do they really say what the Calvinist says that it, that it says? Okay? And the truth is, they don't say that. Um, are there simpler, easier clearer verses that contradict the Calvinist doctrine. And there are lots of them. There are so many more verses that talk about he that believeth and whosoever believeth than elected before the foundation of the world. I have shown you just about every verse that says anything about election before the foundation of the world. Okay. Uh, and there's a whole lot of verses. I mean, go through the Gospel of John. You know, if you get mixed up sometime, just read John. Okay? It is so clear that you're saved by faith alone. Um, and again, I started with this. Don't be overawed by seminary degrees, seeming knowledge of the Greek, and that kind of stuff. We have got, you know, an excellent translation right here. And there's plenty of, of Greek helps that are available to anyone. And uh, you don't have to have a degree to understand the Bible. Okay? Not at all. Um, I said this morning, be faithful, be loyal to the Word of God. God has spoken. And we need to get all our faith, all our beliefs, all our doctrines from this book. And this book alone. Now, people can help you. To understand, there are some, a lot of great books. And if somebody can help you understand a verse in the Bible, praise God. There are some preachers that say, well, you should never read a book. Wouldn't you sit down with a brother in Christ and say, what do you think of this verse? What do you think that means? I mean, can't you be taught? <laughs> I hope you can be taught. And somebody might teach you on the printed page, or my goodness, even on the Internet. But you got to be careful. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's learn, let's grow, let's not be scared of people. Um, the Calvinists don't really have a leg to stand on. Okay, they've got some really weird ideas. And uh, we praise God we've got the Word of God. Mm -hmm.